Romans 8. We begin at verse number one. Just as a reminder, we're in verse four today. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to, a, to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh. And so verse 4, which is what we're considering, in order that the righteous requirement of the law, and today we'll be wrapping up on that purpose clause, in order that, in order that, the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The Lord had blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to gather together. We ask now that you would touch and bless the things that we are about to proclaim as they're being transmitted from on high in the throne room and being conveyed to your people. I pray that this vessel will be um, able, oh God, to be so given and so committed to you that that which is supposed to reach your people will be unhindered and altered. So your people will grasp your will and your purpose and destiny for their lives. We seek these mercies today through Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, with thanksgiving. Amen. Praise God. Today we are in part number 11. Uh, you notice your copy there might still have 10, but it should be part number 11 of our series for the year. And we wish to welcome those who are joining us remotely, either from home or wherever you are at and you are unable to be with us in church. God bless you. Do enjoy the service as we uh, turn to God's word. And part number 11 is still looking at understanding spirit empowerment in the mission of Christ. Last week, we began to consider the Holy Spirit as the ultimate enabler. And in considering the Holy Spirit as the ultimate enabler, we noted the following. First, that the Holy Spirit is the one who not only enables, but empowers us. And we defined empowerment as referring to the authority or power given to someone to do something. We talked about it as the process of becoming stronger or more confident, especially in controlling one's life. And we did mention that many of us love rights, and so the English dictionary does refer to uh, the liberty that people have to claim their rights. But in the context of what we are reading here in the New Testament, we observe that in light of the state of powerlessness in which we as humanity were found, and in which Christ found us all as seekers, we observe the fact that salvation from that point positioned us or we might put it in the present, positions us as children of God for empowerment. And I did mention that there's so much talk about empowerment today. You must understand that the empowerment by the Holy Spirit is the greatest of all that you could ever think about. Acts chapter one, verse eight, you shall receive Power. After that, the Holy Spirit uh, will have come upon you and um, you will be witnesses, the Bible says. So the child of God, we say, increases his or her capacity to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit as his or her life is uh, engaged in active yielding. So that was our emphasis last week, the act of yielding. When there's active yielding in your life and in my life, the Holy Spirit takes charge. 
So you are given not to the flesh, but to the government, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. We were chatting briefly with, uh, uh, with Lisa in the vehicle yesterday, um, coming back from the Belt, reflecting on um, Romans 7. And she made a comment and said, you know, the Bible is an interesting piece of literature. I said, yes, Lisa, it is. And so we're talking about a question she had encountered where the, the question said, so the law there in Romans 7 and Romans 8, is the law in that case good, essentially good? I said, yes, the law is essentially good. But when you come to verse number three, you have a profound expression. The law is good and the intentions of the law were good, but the Bible says what the law was intending to do somehow could not be done in our lives because it was weakened by the flesh. But here's the powerful thing. The powerful thing is that what the law was unable to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. Hallelujah. So I'm saying that when salvation finds us, it finds us in a place where we are ready to begin the process of yielding. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to work and we yield, we learn to yield more, the flesh is overcome and God governs by the power of his Holy Spirit. Somebody shout hallelujah. So that's really the key here. We refer to Joel chapter two and the outpouring of the Spirit. We, don't, uh, we won't repeat all that necessarily, but just to reflect on the fact that that whole promise in Joel 2.28 was a projection towards the empowerment that God intended. And so last week, we revisited an all important question. Why did God promise this empowering, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit at this, at this time? We say that uh, Romans 8, 4 bears three critical insights to that end. And so we're dealing with just the first of those three critical insights. And the first of those three critical insights is divine intentionality. So we'll be exhausting that today. And next week we'll be ready for the second critical uh, aspect and the third one as well. Um, so regarding divine intentionality, as you recall, we introduced ourselves to uh, verse number three, verse number four, by reflecting on that purpose clause, which is introduced by the phrase, in order that. So it says, and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that. Remember the predicament is that the law was given, law was good, the law's intention was good, but what the law was unable to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. Why did God do that? In order that, that's the purpose clause. God's intervention is seen as intentional. And it is described in verse 3 and described even further, not as an afterthought, but a serious intentional intervention. And so we said we needed to walk through Romans 8, and we did walk through Romans 8 all the way from verse number 18 right up to 30. And our summary of that entire passage uh, was the fact that God's sovereign intention and um, next line, please. Further. Yeah, so our summary of the entire passage was that God's sovereign intention was to help us, to help us towards being empowered. So he intended to empower us. And he specifically intended to empower us during the many instances of weakness. And there are many in this life. 
And so that position us to understand why Romans 8 verse 26 is written as follows. Because he's given a huge human example. Then he says in verse number 26 of Romans 8, in the same way. After describing all that, he says, in the same way, the Holy Spirit helps us through our weaknesses when we do not know how to pray. And we'll be talking a little more about prayer today. In that he comes through, Paul says, through groanings which cannot be uttered. And we say that suggests that just as hope sustains the believers when they suffer, so the Holy Spirit helps them when they pray through wordless groans. We use the words of Walter Wessel. So it's the believer who groans in verse 23. And in verse 26, it's the Holy Spirit who's groaning on your behalf and mine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Very, very powerful. So everything God does is intentional. That's really what we zeroed in on. So come with me as we examine the two implications which I preempted. And I say that from this consideration, there are two very serious implications. That's our focus today. Implications that we draw from this facet of how God targets to empower us by directly looking at areas where we are weak and allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to come in in the very areas where we are weak so that we would change who or what governs our lives. Instead of the flesh governing, we have God governing through his Holy Spirit. So today we turn to a consideration of two implications arising out of the matter of divine intentionality. One of those implications is picked right in verse 26. It's to do with prayer. The second intention is also preempted in the very same passage. It's to do with worship. So I want to handle those two today. And like I said, I would like to take my time until Pentecost Sunday in May, where we'll go systematically at key aspects of how the Holy Spirit empowers us. As I know it has already begun, this will alter the way you view the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Our aim is to treat and completely cure this illness of a casualty with which we approach the power of the Holy Spirit and the provision of God in that area. The casualty of how we approach what I have already been describing in the past few weeks as God's sovereign intervention. The choir sang about it today. God's intervention in giving us an opportunity today to be alive, to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We've treated those things with a, with a casualty. So by the same token, we have treated one of these implications out of this whole scenario I've explained, that is prayer, very casually. That is why, as you observe, you talk to any pastor around the world, they will tell you that if they were to assess numbers in terms of how many people attend to things that they call for more than uh, others. They will tell you that Sunday morning or those who worship on Saturday or Sunday, usually no more services Sunday or Saturday are uh, well subscribed to. But go down into the week 
And we have good explanations. Oh, we are busy. I've told you that we are kidding. And we become so casual and excuse ourselves on every front. So you talk to a pastor and say, how many attend the Bible study? They will tell you that it's a fraction. On average, a third of those who appear on a popular Sunday morning. Because that's a stylish day. You laugh because you identify with the fact that this is true. They will tell you that at a prayer meeting, probably again a third, because usually that becomes like the number of a critical mass that's very consistent. And let me tell you that here in this assembly, predictably, if I came and appeared on a Wednesday evening or on a Friday evening when we have prayer, hear me, church, I'm talking to not me assembly this morning. I could tell you predictably the critical mass because we become a familiar as to who they are and who you will find. Now, and I, don't want, I do not want to relent from this. I want to continue to remind you that for as long as that is the scenario, it is a continual indication of the laxity that is unfortunately in our lives. And that is the reason why you must hear this message on empowerment with a certain measure of reverence. God is privileging you again with an opportunity to see that He wants you to get up from your laxity. Get up! Get up from your dead habits. Get up from excusing yourself with issues of sin. Get up. There is something better. There's something higher. God desires something bigger for you. And I said many years before, if there's something we must overcome, it's the sin of the average Christian or average Christianity. It's not business as usual. Coronavirus jolted us, we now have to wear masks. I wish we could see, think about spiritual things in the same way. The masks have become, masks have become a means of survival and safety from infection. So how can you claim to love Christ and treat prayer the way you do? Excuses. How? Eh, no. Bishop, you don't know my life. I don't. But God does and God knows that you're kidding. Hello, 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 hello. Anybody in the house? So, if the Holy Spirit targets those areas of weakness. His intention is to empower us. So, because that intentionality implies that God expects that we will make effort to access that empowerment in the area of prayer, we must revisit this area of prayer. Prayer is a strategic, spiritually empowered weapon. That's what it is. God designed it that way. And you and I treat it with contempt, with casualty. God is not happy. We read Second Chronicles. We hear it often. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn away from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. Ah, but we're ready to do that when there is a program called prayer. 
National Day of Prayer, or this or the other. But prayer, by God's intention, is not a program. It is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. So let's revisit 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 3. Let's read it again. This is a strategic weapon. In the past few weeks, we've seen uh, on the news this um, young Zambia Air Force um, fighter pilot, first female fighter pilot, this, this young lady, Captain uh, Muamba, I think is her name. She's been out there as a, an ambassador for the cyber bullying um, bill and, and that whole campaign against cyberbullying. When you think of a jet fighter, which has to do with air power, that weaponry, if you will, that's contained in air power, is always strategic. It's very strategic. It is meant to support the infantry on the ground, give cover. Strategic is designed that way. Prayer is that air power that is designed by God to help cover you here on earth. You know very well, the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers. You and I are in a constant warfare arrangement here on earth. How can we ever live life? So casually, when we are under such serious spiritual attack, how? And think we'll recover? For though we live in this world, we do not wage war the way the world does. Verse number four. For the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. That's the empowerment I'm talking about. They have divine power. So prayer is a strategic weapon. So if anything, if we understood this, the prayer meeting should be the most well-attended meeting because our lives depend on our prayer commitment. It's a church hearing the voice of God today. Now you might say to me, no, Bishop, no, but uh, it doesn't mean that only when I come on Friday is the only time that I'm praying. I know that. But if we follow this thing, about your non-availability, if we follow you carefully, you probably will find that even in your own private life, there's hardly much attention. There's maybe a few who may be that committed, but there's probably uh, very little attention being given to prayer, even there in private. Because usually what you do in public is an indication of some of what you aspire for privately. Ah, are we together? So in this year of community transformation, revisiting the mission of Jesus, and in this season where as a fellowship we're looking at spirit-empowered empowerment, spirit-empowered transformation, excuse me, there needs to be a shift. Everybody say shift. There needs to be a shift. There needs to be a shift of gears. Because prayer is that divine weapon. Strategic. It's a tool of empowerment. So on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Verse number five. We demolish 
arguments, not by arguing. We demolish them by prayer. We tackle the power behind those arguments. You can only do that. You can only go behind the enemy lines by prayer. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Do you understand that terminology? I wish I would have a few military people here to try and explain that for me. Behind enemy lines, by prayer. You can go in and strike them from the back, from the front, and win the war. We demolish arguments, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Look at what has happened, even as we've been talking much about COVID-19. We have actually identified this. Even though we know it's a virus, it's out there, we have questions, its origins, and so on. People argue, we all know that there are issues there. We may never settle them in this life, but God knows. There are all those things. The issue is that the very manifestation of this virus is evil in the sense that it's against the very principle of life. We've talked about that. It's evil in the sense that it's very much against the God, God's principle of fellowship and intimacy where we are all supposed to be together, close together. We can't shake hands anymore. We can't hug anymore. We can't, come on, something is wrong. And that's the reason why this is something we must keep hitting at by prayer until it goes in the name of Jesus. It's a pretension. They come up with terminology, such a distance, such a distancing, What? It's not part of our lives. But you see, we can just sit back. No, definitely see it, but It must end now in the name of Jesus. So we take captive. This is in prayer. We take captive every thought. And every intention and make it obedient to Christ. You can't achieve this, beloved, except through prayer. So I'm calling the church to a new level of commitment in this area. We must understand that by design, God has sent His Holy Spirit to energize us in this area. It's a difficult area to sustain um, consistently. It's a difficult area to keep and stay in focus with. And that is why the Holy Spirit has come. He has been given to us so that in the areas where we fail, He comes to empower us so we can stay on our knees and so we can continue to target the things that work against the purposes of God. Oh, I've been there in my life many, many times and we've been there in our own ministry many, many times. There are things that have come and have ended up uh, really being so close to really pushing us and doing all kinds of damage. And in prayer, we have knelt before the Lord. We have targeted those issues and we have gone before the Lord. And it has only been in the sense of saying, oh God, come through. And we have seen it over these many years, how God takes center stage, changes circumstances and He answers prayer. But the church must see the value. And God has chosen sovereignly to use prayer in this fashion. So we must make it a lifestyle. How do we make it a lifestyle? We participate when others are participating. But that also means that Wherever we are, we sustain a conversation with God. Make time. Make time. That's your devotion. Young people, there's nothing else I can offer to you but this. You've heard my story. I came to Christ while at a very, very young and tender age. I have seen how by prayer, God has kept my life. It's that simple. 
and he can keep you focused and away from the dross that's causing many young people to go away. I will need the, um, the cable. I will need the cable. We need to connect here. Uh, my computer says low battery. That's exactly what must happen. Great illustration. It says low battery. Your Mac will sleep soon unless plugged into a power outlet. I love God. How he can use even a machine like this to get a message to us. Your life will sleep soon unless you plug it back into the power source. Hallelujah. All right, let, let the cables roll in. It's a live illustration this morning. So imagine this, the cable is out there because it stays in the bag. So where's your cable today? Hello, where's your cable? <laughs> Sometimes that is what happens in our lives. May God help us. All right. While they're bringing the cables, let's go to the second and final thing that is an implication from uh, this divine intentionality. So prayer is a strategic, spiritually empowered weapon. It is not a program, but it is meant to be a lifestyle. Second thing that is an implication from God's intentionality uh, which we've been discussing, is worship. Worship is intended to be a lifestyle. So I can tell you now that it was, it is at 1%. It was at 1% and it said your Mac will shut down unless it is, unless it is plugged <laughs> to power. Hey, 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 hey. The good thing is, even when there's little power left, God is still reaching out to you and you can plug back in today. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's talk a little bit about worship. Worship is intended to be a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle matter. For our sustained connection. With the throne room in heaven. That's what worship is meant to be. So these two things arise from God's intentionality in bringing the Holy Spirit into our lives. In both prayer and worship, the Holy Spirit is active. He wants to be active. He wants to work with us. And like I've been teaching in the past few weeks on Wednesday nights, let me bring a little bit of that into this session today. Worship it's not this thing that begins when our favorite worship leader is in front of us. They will say, ah, let's now, let's now worship. It ought to be a lifestyle. And in our churches, sometimes we hype the atmosphere. We think when we've made enough noise, ah, there was worship. Ah, uh -uh, we've created an atmosphere. And I was saying on Wednesday night, We've created an atmosphere in the church where sometimes we can't worship unless our favorite choir dressed in, the, in our best, in our one most appealing um, colors, unless it's them. Then we can't worship. Unless our favorite bishop or apostle or teacher or pastor or prophet is there, then we can't worship. And we've 
done this thing where in the house of God, we've got these stars we have created. And I was saying on Wednesday night, the only one star must exist in the church. It's the star of David, the morning star, the bright and morning star, Jesus Christ and Him alone. We create stars here. And when our star is in front, hey, these days we have uh, this, this artist, that artist, come on, cut it off. I want us to enter the throne room in Revelation chapter 4. As I make this point, and I'll be calling the team very soon to come and join me here. But let me make the point quickly. And we spend some time in God's presence. Here is God's intention for worship. Look at it in heaven. In the throne room. Revelation 4. Let's begin at verse number 9. In fact, it can be in verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, covered with eyes, all around, and even under its wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. For the sake of those who haven't been there for the Bible studies, between chapter 4 and chapter 5, there are five hymns sung in heaven. Five hymns. And the first hymn commences in verse 8, where it says, Holy, holy, holy. We refer to that as the trisagion. Is it a bishop? What is that? Come Wednesday night, we'll explain to you. Eh? Zibuela. <laughs> All right. Holy, holy, holy. It could have been said in one holy. But why is it being said in holy, holy, holy? Three holies. When that kind of thing happens, there is emphasis. And this kind of emphasis is unique. Calling attention to the holiness of God. There are five of these hymns, like I said, between chapter four and chapter five, being sung in heaven. So verse number nine, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. Just look at that and understand that worship here it's not focus on some star in front here, your favorite worship leader or your favorite bishop, no matter how electric or electrifying you think he might be. It's none of that. The focus is on him. The sum total was saying Wednesday night of God's attributes, his glory. It points to his worthy person or presence. The idea of honor. When it says, whenever they, the, four, the, four live, the living creatures give glory and honor, so there's glory, there is honor. Glory points to his worthy person or presence. Honor points to his worthy distinction. He is in his own class. We heard from Tanda here when she was introducing the choir song. And then they sang about how awesome God is. And we stand in awe of Him. Very fitting song that was done by the choir. So whenever they give glory and honor and thanks, the issue of thanks points to His works. And we saw all that in the song that the choir sang here. Thanks pointing to his works for which we ought to be thankful. If you go on into verse number 10, Revelation 4, verse 10, the 24 elders 
fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. The idea of falling down is about prostration. It's like this. It's prostration. Down on the ground. This is the natural response. They hear him and they fall down. 24 elders in heaven. Prostrating oneself before him. Before someone who is worthy of homage or obeisance. And God is worthy. I said he's worthy. So when we come into his house, it's not about the choir. It's not about Bishop Banda. It's not about your favorite apostle. And uh, favorite this, favorite that. Some people you call favorite you've never even seen or met in person. Somehow you have an attachment. But why can't you get this attachment with heaven, my dear friends? Because he who sits on the throne is the real reason why we are alive. And when you keep him at the center of your life, worship is the natural thing today. You will worship him with your voice, with your time. And when we consider worship in this fashion, giving money should not be an issue. Because it's just as easy. You're falling down before him. So take money, throw it at the altar. But you know why? It's hard to worship. Because even when you're giving money, you take it out and you wonder, oh my, I... Don't even know what they do with this money. <laughs> you can't worship. What should happen is that when you give, there must be a release. And the next thing is worship. It's, that we, it's what my cousins up north do. Let me give them credit today. My cousins up north are very good at this. They go before a king. Shaka panga. I like the richness that my brothers and sisters up north express the way they express the honor of their kings. Now where I come from, we do that as well. We do Sebayet in Kos, Yamakos, Wingonis. But I must give credit. When you look at the numbers of words, superlatives in the, in the language of the north, very amazing, truly descriptive of whoever they are giving honor to. And it should be like that for us when we come before the Lord, describing who He is. It's about Him. And I've said when we were teaching this on Wednesday, I said the idea of falling down is that of prostrating oneself to give homage to someone. The Greek word used for worship here is used frequently within the New Testament to convey the same idea. And the word means to make obeisance, to give reverence to, to prostrate oneself before someone as an act of reverence. And the emphasis here is on God's creation, revealing His very attributes as the Creator. So when we come into the house of God, we come in here, regardless of who is here in front or who is not, you get in, tune your heart, join in. In heaven, this is constantly going on. The 24 elders are falling before Him. They take their crowns and they throw them there. And we said on Wednesday night, crowns are like representing the things that, that, that we like most, things that we have achieved, our education, our attainments and so on. Those things sometimes stand between us and God. We come with those attainments in the church and if people don't recognize us, we are offended and we go away. We fail to worship, but I'm here to let you know, get it out, put it down. Come on, there is one greater and higher than you. We must come before Him and simply let go. We must come before Him and realize he is the maker of heaven and earth. He is the creator of all that we are and could ever be. And He has called us into His holy and mighty presence and He's inviting us to connect with what is already happening, happening in heaven. And He wants us to be able to say, like the thousands upon, angels, upon thousands of angels in heaven, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is filled with Your glory, not the whole of Zambia. He's 
is filled with uh, my degrees because I'm better than this one. I'm better than the other one. Cut it out. And even with your money, like I said, if you give it in terms of worship, when you give, it's a release. And the next thing is you're worshiping. How do you worship God? So worship is intentional by God. Ah, but here's the powerful thing, beloved. He still has provided his Holy Spirit to help us get in tune. So even when we are weak, because our minds like to focus on who we are and who we are better than, hey, hey, the Holy Spirit sees us, hey, hey, he comes. If we yield, he goes right there. We're saying, hey, hey, he goes right there. He says, ah, let me help you, my child. I know you're doing, hey, 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 but I know inside you're willing. So let me help you, my child. Hallelujah. God is good. I said, God is good. God is good, beloved. He comes. So in the same way, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. In that even when we don't know how to pray, He targets those areas of our weakness. So even when we don't know how to worship, He wants us to realize that He's here. He's the one that creates the atmosphere. And I want us to learn to come into God's house and be able to key into that atmosphere of heaven. Because worship, Pastor Boyd, you were saying earlier, this is what we will do in heaven. It's already going on in heaven and if you read chapter 4 and chapter 5 oh my goodness and we're studying chapter 4 right now of Revelation the Bible describes how the four living creatures 24 elders surrounding the throne then it talks about the thrones angels tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and 10,000 upon 10,000 and it goes on the multitude and it says encircling the throne so when we come here beloved nothing else exists we are joining the throne room and at the center of the throne is the one who sits there on the throne read with me Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 11 let's begin it at verse number 9 the last three hymns are sung there in verse number 9 and they sung a new song you are worthy oh God to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, every language and people and nation and you have made them into a kingdom of priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Ah, but let's go on to verse number 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. Tell me what that number is. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And what, beloved, in the next line and in a loud voice. That's why I believe they were Pentecostal and they are Pentecostal because they are loud. In a loud voice, they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Where is your PhD there? Where is your master's there? Where is your bachelor's there? We throw them all out because God is all that matters. When you follow the scriptures, this is the logical and practical flow of the process at Pentecost and beyond. If you read Acts chapter 2, they were gathered in one place. They had been worshipping. 
Suddenly, there came the sound of a mighty rushing wind. It filled that place. And then, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And people saw on them images that looked like tongues of fire. And they all began to speak with other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And the world of the then day was changed. People began to say, ah, what's happening? Are they drunk? And Peter gets up in chapter two and he says to them, hey, how can you say these people are drunk? It is only nine o'clock in the morning. Ah, but Peter was able to say, this is that, this is that, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. For he said, it shall come to pass after this that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And then Peter called them to a place of commitment and he told them, repent. When you read verse 42, Lots of things had happened. People had been born again. They were now all together, gathering now in homes, praying, reading the word, fellowshipping. That became the order. You go to chapter three of um, Acts. You see Peter and John at the hour of prayer, going to the temple to worship. And this is what God is calling us to. The Holy Spirit remains the ultimate enabler, not by accident, but by God's deliberate action, intentionality to empower us, to lift up his church in order that we might have him manifest through us. Next week, I'll be dealing with the second aspect of these implications. And we'll be dealing with the phrase that has to do with the law in order that the law, that lack of the law, might manifest in us. We're we'll dealing with that next week. Today we conclude with this purpose clause in order that. And it's a serious call to commitment. Let me invite you to surrender all and yield to him unreservedly. I'll ask the choir to come and join me here just now. And God is here, beloved. He wants to help you and I to get into Tune of heaven. Are you ready? Are you ready? Well, let's please stand and let's go before the Lord just now.